Well, good morning. Happy 4th of July. Um, I would just like to say thank you for that sermon bumper video because I don't know how to do that. But Pastor Sean set me up to win with that one. Makes me feel like I just want to go into the forest and never come out. Um, yeah, so anyway, good morning. We're going to be talking this morning about Luke, thir- Luke 6, 37, 42. Lori actually preached a little mini sermon of exactly what I'm going to explain today. So um, it's not one of the most famous scriptures, I would say, but it's definitely one of the most quoted scriptures, even if you didn't know that you were quoting it. The first part of Luke 637 says, do not judge. So have you ever been judged by someone? Or maybe you were the one being kind of judgy? Um, About a month or so ago, on two separate occasions, I asked two of my closest friends um, how I was doing at life and leadership. And these are the words that they said. It was probably not these words specifically, but this was the story that I told myself. You expect me to keep up with your excitement level and get everything done as fast as you do. Sometimes guilt gets people to do the things that you want. If I don't meet your expectations, then I feel you judging me. Your instructions feel overwhelming and placed upon me without asking for my opinion. So I'm sure you wouldn't judge me when you find out that the next step that I took was getting all up in my head and an immediate shame spiral downward. A few weeks after those discussions, I needed to choose another scripture for out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John for my next exegetical paper. And because I had already purchased this expensive commentary in Luke, that's what I chose to go with in Luke, and God was right in the middle of using my words, the words that my friends had given me to transform my heart, when I opened the commentary book straight to, Genesis, or to Luke 6, 37, do not judge. A week after that, Pastor Sean asked if I would preach this Sunday morning, so clearly I knew that I needed to say yes. So I'm guessing that most of you would agree that it doesn't feel good to be judged, I'm going to start this morning by asking you to think of a time when you felt like you might have judged someone. And likely, like me, you probably felt completely justified in that judgment, even, even good intentions, thinking something like um, knowing full well that their life would be better if they just fill in the blank. Maybe their life would be better if they just read the Bible more, or they, their life would be better if they would just hung out with me more, or whatever it is, fill in the blank. So you're not alone. We have the inclination to judge, and I find sometimes even more so as God transforms my own heart and gives me clarity about my life and what the vision for a life community might look like. So get a picture in your mind of a time that you judge somebody and maybe keep that moment or that person's face um, in your mind while we explore Luke 6, 37 through 42. Here's what it says. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like the teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take that speck out of your eye. When you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Lord, I just pray today that these words will speak truth into our hearts. God, anything that is Amy's words, let it fall to the ground. I give you the space, Lord. Let everything that comes out be of you and from you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have to start today by recognizing that this kind of scripture requires God's grace to transform our hearts and minds. Because do not judge is not an easy thing for us to do. So we all just learned about God's grace and how it meets us where we are. If you want to go back and see Pastor Sean's journey of grace, it's on YouTube. But we know that his grace meets us right where we are. And I love that the Holy Spirit transforms us both personally and in community. I'm an extrovert, so I want it to be in a big group of people like this and not just by myself. Um, Robert Mulholland is a, is a theologian. He's a teacher. He's an author of a book, um, the book Invitation to a Journey. It's had a profound impact on my life. I have it. You can borrow it if you'd like. Um, he says this about the personal and communal journey of transformation. Spiritual transformation is the process of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others. So the process of being formed in the image of Christ is where the journey of transformation takes all of us. 
the direction that we're going is the same, right? It's always towards Christ. However, the pace at which we experience the journey is unique for each person. So transformation is going to look different for each person, even though we're all on the path towards Christ. The author of the passage today is Luke, and he tended to focus on the outcasts and the marginalized and the lost. And he often emphasizes that salvation is possible for everyone everywhere. And there may have been many people in that crowd, believers and non-believers. But this specific scripture that we're talking about today, he was focused on the people who already were committed to following him. So that's those of us online and in the room that already claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Um, And it's important to note that because this is not about how to get into the kingdom of God. This is what is already expected of those of us in the kingdom of God. So for those of us that are believers, this is what is expected. Jesus begins with a command. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. So for me, there's some immediate tension there. Do not judge. So what does that mean about murderers and abusers and lawbreakers? We're not supposed to judge them? No, that's not what he's saying. He does say, do not judge, yes. But the original Greek root is this word krino, which, is, which means to decide, to determine, to call into question. What Jesus' command does not say is that the human institution of law is forbidden. Because in the context that we're reading today, the word judge does not refer to judges in a court of law, but rather to the responsibility that we have for one another. So John Wesley was an 18th century pastor, he's a theologian, and he says this, this is the kind of judging we're talking about. The judging that Jesus condemns here is thinking about another person in a way that is contrary to love. Jesus is saying, don't make someone else feel inferior or try to inspire them to change based on your guilt. Don't look at someone and decide if they are worthy of love and belonging. This kind of judging towards others holds them down in shame and never seeks to encourage them towards Jesus. It sees other people as hopeless, beyond God's reach. This might mean looking at others and making big what is small, making assumptions about their whole story, expecting other people to live up to your standards, excusing their past and their pain, and asserting that you are right and they are wrong, and Christ is saying, stop, do not judge. As Christians, we might know what God wants, but we are not God. When we act like him, by sitting in the judgment seat, it pushes people away. So then what are we to do? Verse 7, 37, the rest, 37b says, Forgive, and it will be forgiven, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The Message Bible puts it this way. Words that we might use today. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. Give away your life. You'll find your life given back. But not merely given back. Given back with bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting, is the way. Generosity begets generosity. So, if you ask anybody who knows me well, it's not hard to find out that from the time I could talk until this very day, I don't like to be told what to do. My mother giggles, of course. She knows it. My husband is probably biting his tongue. Uh, I'm fiercely independent. It seems much easier to do things my way and ignore those who don't do it like me. I tend to be very efficient at getting things done. I could probably pack 20 lunches while signing your kids up for camp and making a Kidman video all at the same time. So when I see other people doing it different than me, I'm quick to want to correct them with the correction that is Amy's best way. Not considering what is best for them or the value that their way might bring to my life. God has blessed me with the ability to see how things could be and then inspire others to create goals and work towards them in hope, faith, and confidence. It's my job and my passion to lead people towards their purpose in Christ. My friends revealed to me that I was being judgmental towards them and to others. I was trying to lead them towards what was God's best for Amy, not God's best for them. It was painful to hear, but it helped me realize that I was using my God-given talent and leadership in leadership to steamroll creative ideas, to judge their unique strategies, and use guilt to get people to do it my way. 
my, des my desire and ability to achieve hurt people close to me because I was too busy doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing instead of what God wanted me to be doing. God's grace is transforming me every day that I spend time alone with him. He also uses some of my closest friends to teach me how to slow down, offer grace, patiently come alongside people while they work through their things. The unspoken message of the heart, at the heart of Jesus' negative command, do not judge, is the oft-repeated positive command, love one another. So is Jesus then telling us to never have a hard conversation about right from wrong, to have no moral compass at all? No. Our culture teaches us that the world is either A or B. I'm guilty of thinking that my way is better, so your way must be wrong. We live in a judgmental culture that will cancel you quick as can be if you say something that others perceive as wrong. If we skip to verses 41 and 42, Jesus actually uses some humor to exaggerate the importance of self-awareness and transformation so that we are then able to help others connect to Jesus and his ways with love and humility instead of this selfish my way or the highway style. So let's look at this next slide. Again, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take this speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the plank from your brother's eye. So, uh, we're going to use some humor, just like Jesus did, to uh, explain what this looks like in real time. Um, you don't have to raise your hands, but can you think of a time when you might have exaggerated somebody else's faults or sins while minimizing your own? Uh, sometimes, like, complaining about somebody who's on your tail, um, but then you race up to the car in front of you and then you blame them for being too slow. It's like we, we, we exaggerate other people's flaws, but we minimize our own. So I thought we might use a little bit of humor this morning to illustrate this for you. I've asked my good friend Chris Skaggs, who knows a lot about specks and logs and pieces of wood, and his sons, um, to show you what this might have looked like in Jesus' day with Jesus' wording. So here in my hand, I have a tiny little speck. Most of you probably can't even see it. I don't know if you can see it online. It's a tiny little speck and um, a little piece of sawdust. Chris Gag calls, he calls sawdust man glitter. So I have a little tiny piece of man glitter in my hand right here. And uh, this, this morning, represents the sin in my life. Okay? Now, when we hear the word plank, which is going to represent or illustrate the sin in Chris's life this morning, when we hear this word plank, we probably often think of something simple like a two-by-four. This is, a, this is what I think of. I picture things when I think them. Thanks, Trevor. Um, maybe if you build things often or you're thinking really crazy today, you might even think plank as big of like something like this. Maybe a four by eight, right? We might go this big. Thanks, Trenton. However, the word Jesus used is better defined like this. A beam, a joist, a huge log. Okay? This is a little bit more like what Jesus was talking about. So here's this sin in my life. Here's this sin in Chris's life. And watch as we demonstrate how ridiculous it would be for Chris to help me remove this speck while he's carrying around this gigantic log. Let's do it. No, it's not going to happen. Thanks anyway. Thanks anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? It's absurd. It's absurd to think that that would help. How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you fail to see the plank that's in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I think Jesus is explaining two important things this morning. Number one. Both parties have something obstructing their view. The point is not that Chris had a giant log and I had a tiny speck. Even though Jesus did exaggerate to get his point across, the point is that we both have something in our eyes. We have all sinned. Pastor Sean recently said it this way, sin levels the playing field. 
We all started our stories with the lyrics of Amazing Grace. I once was lost, now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. We're on the same page, in need of grace and forgiveness. Jesus' command not to judge is a call for me to be aware of my own blindness. To do that, I have to ask myself, am I listening and cooperating with where the Holy Spirit is working in my heart? Carrying a log around every day is uncomfortable. Ask Chris Skaggs how hard that job is every day. Having a speck in your eye is uncomfortable. Ask Chris about it. He comes home every day with specks in his eyes. We can get used to carrying the log around and the speck in our eye, and we can make, even start making excuses for why it's there. That's just how I'm wired. I've always been carrying this log. I don't know any other way. We tell people the log isn't heavy, and we say that the speck doesn't hurt because we have no picture of what life without it might look like. So we believe the lie that the discomfort that they cause will never end. Transformation is uncomfortable, too but it leads to abundant life, free from heavy logs and irritating specks. So which discomfort will you choose? Our desire to be transformed has to be greater than our desire to keep carrying that log around with us. Are we listening and believing what God is saying about who we are, allowing grace to transform us into who we're becoming? If we have not acknowledged the log in our eye, admitted it to Christ, asked for forgiveness, then we're not ready to help other people remove the speck from their eyes. Every effort that we make will end up hurting and not healing. God will let us keep our logs. It's a hard thought. He will let us keep them. We can choose to never deal with the pain and discomfort that is inevitable when you have a foreign object in your eye. We can ignore our sin and refuse to repent and align our behaviors with Christ. But if a tiny speck of wood in my eye can be painful and cause danger, how much more so is the unresolved sin in my life? As long as we ignore what is in our eye, it doesn't matter who we help. We will always approach them from our place of pain, self-righteousness, ego, and self-preservation. As Chris stepped closer to me to remove the speck, help me take the speck out, he started taking out everything in his path. He could have even taken out my good eye with his log, the one eye that I can see out of. The unresolved sin that we choose to carry around, it will hit people in the face every time. Judged people judge people. Hurting people hurt people. But forgiven people forgive people. Do you want to experience God's transformation in your life? Then we have to be open to the fact that God is still doing a work in every one of us. Ask yourself, what's obstructing my view? If you can't see the log in your eye and you want to know what's blinding you, ask a friend. Ask the people that you trust. Create a safe and vulnerable place where they have your permission to answer honestly. I was telling you earlier that I had asked a couple of my friends about my logs and specs, and I was pretty confident that I would get only positive feedback. I really didn't think I was blind anywhere. This is how I say it. What's it like on the other side of me? What's it like on the other side of my leadership? What's it like on the other side of my friendship? I would never sit here and pretend like this is an easy question to ask or an easy question to answer. But I asked them to tell me the truth, and I desperately wanted to know where I was blind. Their answers were gut-wrenching to hear. Transformation is not easy. I could have chosen to stay in the shame spiral and believe the whispers. You're not good enough. You heard God wrong. You're not worthy of this role. Instead, the Holy Spirit used the pain from my speck and the words of my friends to begin to transform my heart once again. I know my friends love me. I asked them to be honest. I even prepared them a week in advance so that they could pray about what they were going to say. God's grace in their lives allowed me to speak them to speak the truth in love, and I had asked them for it anyway. This is why we value personal connection at Life Community Church, because everything changes when it's someone you know, and it's why we value growth, because healthy things grow. It's why it's so important to engage in a faith community. I recognize that not all of you might have somebody to ask about your specs and logs, but you can. You can start doing life with people that you trust and people that you feel safe with to be honest and vulnerable. 
There's a connect card right next to you somewhere. There's a connect link online. We have life groups. We have discipleship groups. We have mentors. We have Bible studies. You can get, engage with people that you can start building that trust. God is faithful, and in your solitude with him, he will show you the places in your life that need some tree removal if you let him. Then you will begin to see clearly enough to help someone else with the speck in their eye. So this is the second thing that Jesus is teaching us this morning. When we are seeing more clearly, we become compelled to move towards others in humility. I just want to note, it's when we see more clearly, not perfectly, just more clearly. Because I'm not perfect. I still have specks and logs in my eye. But I continue moving towards Christ every day. So within your circles of trust, those people that you love, that you do life with, that you grow with, don't ignore the pain in their eyes. Jesus' point here is that we all have stuff. Specks or logs, we are all in need of grace and forgiveness. Remember that the person that you're seeking to help is just like you. Raise your hand if you have ever had a little speck in your eye. Right? Almost everybody online, have you ever had a little speck in your eye? Sean's watching, give a little emoji, hands up. So, so just name some of the things that you might do right after that happens. That speck hits your eye, what do you do? Touch it. What else? Cry. <laughs> Cry. That's a good one. I get really close to the mirror. If I can't see it myself, I might run over to Steve. Steve, what is in my eye? This is hurting. Is this what you do, Chris? He comes home, Joanne, there's a thing in my eye. Can you get it out? Right? We ask someone to look. We might put drops in it, crying, right? If Francie has something in her eye, I cannot squirt visine from here. It's not going to work, right? I have to get all up in her business. I get really close to her face. I have to stick my finger in her eye. Yeah. Ouch. Anyway, we have to get close. I have to have a personal connection with her. It's highly unlikely that a complete stranger would walk up to me and be like, hey, can you stick your finger in one of the most sensitive places of my body? Right? That's probably not, I mean, unless it's an emergency. <laughs> That's very unlikely to happen. No, I will tell you, I can mess with Steve's eye even though it terrifies him. He can't even watch me put contacts in. But he'll let me do it. Why? Because we've built 22 years of trust and love with each other. I'm pretty certain that Lysandra Trine would let me remove a speck from her eye, but we've spent seven years praying together and eating meals together and crying and praying together. I have a personal connection with him. I have built relational credibility. So we have to get close and be gentle with their eyes. Forcing our way into a sensitive area of one's life does not lead them to Christ. Our responsibility is not to get them to act a certain way, but rather to connect them to Christ. At Life Community Church, we long to connect people to Jesus and their life's purpose. Why? Because he transforms them, not us. He does the work. His grace does the work. As much as I want to believe that my striving will do it, it doesn't. So Jesus is saying two things. Both parties have something obstructing their view. And when we begin to see more clearly, we become compelled to move towards others in humility. So where are you today? Maybe you don't have any friends close enough to ask about the log. Maybe you believe that God's done removing logs from your life, so you get overly focused on speck removal of others. I'm there sometimes. Maybe you acknowledge the log, but you haven't, you've gotten really good at just overcompensating. You can just use one eye and that's good enough. Maybe you believe that it would take a lot of work to get that log out now. It's been there for so long and it's so deeply rooted in who I am. I've seen Chris Gaggs clear out trees. It terrifies me. It looks so hard and he's up so high and the heights are uncomfortable and he's got tools that I've never even heard of or seen anywhere on the internet. I could not ever do that. He can't do it alone. So we have to go back to verse 39. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. At our core, we are all blind. I need a teacher who doesn't have a log in their eye to come close and help me. 
Bible reading is good, but it can't remove the speck. Serving is great and giving is outstanding, but it cannot take it out. My commitment to lifestyle change and striving to achieve can't remove my log. There is no tool or thing that can take it out, but there is someone. P.S. It isn't Chris Skaggs, even though he's really good at his job. I want desperately to help my friends, but first I need someone who is not blind to show me the way. I need someone to illuminate the log in my life so I can repent and surrender. One who isn't blind. One who is perfect. One who knows the extent of my blindness and instead of judging me will come close and save me. I need someone who has the right to judge me and instead takes my judgment of others and offers me forgiveness. Instead of swatting us with our logs, he takes the log and hang on it for us. Instead of calling us out on the cross, he was called out for our sins. We can surrender our lives to Jesus and believe that by faith he died for all of us. If you haven't done that, now's a good time. There's no one too repulsive in their sin that he wouldn't want to take that log out of your life. He loves to take logs out. It's what he does. It's why he came. And when we are forgiven, we can look across the table at our friends with eyes of love. My friends, who are on their own journey of being formed in the image of Christ for the sake of others, looked across the table at me with love and truth. And I'm so grateful. They love Jesus, and they love me. They have logs and specks that they're carrying around every day, but they acknowledge them, and they confess them, and they believe that they are forgiven, and forgiven people forgive people. So in a moment, worship team's going to join us, and we're going we're gonna to take communion together. I think about the people at the table with Jesus that day, Judas, the traitor. Peter, who would shortly after the meal deny that he even knew who Jesus was. Yet Jesus looked at them from across the table with eyes of love. And he offered them the bread and the cup. The only one worthy of sitting on the judgment seat is Jesus Christ. The worship team is going to play Amazing Grace. Reflect on what logs you might be carrying around with you. Where have you been judgmental? What specks are making it hard for you to look across the table at people with love? I'm going to come back up and we're going to take communion. If you haven't grabbed one, go ahead and do that. Get it open and ready. Um, worship team's going to lead us.